Uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate Steve for organizing this uh, symposium. Now, whilst we were preparing this uh, symposium, Scott and I have learned that Steve organizes conferences in exactly the same way as he writes scholarly papers, meticulously and with great eye for detail. So, Steve, uh, congratulations. Now, I was asked to give some details regarding the General Scolium. We all know that the General Scolium was published for the first time in 1713, that is, in the second edition of the Principia, and that it was expanded in the third edition. We have five holograph drafts of the General Scolium, drafts A to E. Now, the letters A to E refer to the order in which these manuscripts have been preserved. The order of composition is a different matter. Now, I have tried to order the five holograph drafts of the General Scolium, and in this context, I have based myself on the following principle, namely, X is composed after Y, if and only if, the additions above and under the line in Y are part of the main text of X, and the deletions in Y are absent from X. Now, if we apply this principle to the five drafts, it turns out that draft A was composed uh, as the first draft, C as the second, D as the third, E as the fourth, and B as the fifth. Now, let me provide you with some details regarding these five holograph drafts. Drafts A, D, E, and B are equally long. Drafts E and B correspond very closely to the published version in the second edition of the Principia. And draft C is twice as long as the other drafts. It has 2,000 words and it contains a large amount of theological material and 12 short propositions on the electrical spirit. Some details regarding the structure of the General Scolium. Now, the General Scolium has six paragraphs. In the first paragraph, Newton argues against Vortisches, and this will be addressed by Chris Smink in his presentation. In the second and third paragraph, Newton offers his famous design argument, and this will be analyzed by Steve in his presentation. The fourth paragraph is the long theological paragraph, and this will be analyzed and contextualized by Paul Greenham, Steve Snowblen, Irena Bacchus, Dmitry Levitin, and by myself in my own presentation. The fifth paragraph contains Newton's methodological defense, and this will be discussed by Mary Domsky in her presentation. The final and sixth paragraph concerns the electrical spirit, and this will be contextualized by Cesare Pastorino in his presentation. Now, as to my own presentation, I will focus on the fourth paragraph. I have taken a, a complete editorial history of the general scholium, but for reasons of time constraint, I will focus on the fourth paragraph. Now, the structure of my presentation is as, as follows. In the first part, I will provide a brief introduction on the context out of which the general scholium grew. In the second part, I will discuss the fourth paragraph. And in the third part, I would like to draw your attention between the differences between the context out of which the general scolium grew and the context out of which the theological portions of the queries grew. I would like to make two caveats. First of all, I need to study one more manuscript at Wren Library, and I also need to inspect some of Newton's private copies of the book mentioned in my chapter and in my presentation. And also note that most quotations will not be read aloud during my presentation for reasons of time constraints. However, all quotations are on the handouts. On 2 March 1712-1713, Newton sent Roger Coates, who was in charge of the editorial work, a draft of the General Scolium. On 18 March, that is about a fortnight before the final changes for the new edition of the Principia were sent, Coates sent the following letter to Newton, and the letter is shown on page 9 of the handout. Now, in this letter, Coates draws Newton's attention to what he calls a very extraordinary letter of Leibniz, which was published in the Mémoire de Littérature. In his letter to the editor of the Mémoire de Littérature, Leibniz famously attacked the notion of gravitational interaction across empty space. Because in his view, gravity is an occult quality insofar as it is understood as being, and I quote, performed without any mechanism by a simple primitive quality or by a law of God who produces that effect without using intelligible means, end of quotation. Moreover, 
If gravity is dependent on God's will, and I quote again, you will have to recourse to a miracle, and even to a perpetual miracle. For the will of God works through a miracle whenever we are not able to account for that will and its effects from the nature of the objects. End of quotation. Leibniz's letter, in other words, contained both a methodological as well as a theological attack on Newton's natural philosophy. In his vigorous response to Leibniz's letter, which he ultimately never sent, Newton stated that the theory of universal gravitation has been, and I, and I quote, has been proved by mathematical demonstrations grounded upon experiments and the phenomena of nature, end of quotation, and that gravity is a manifest quality seated in bodies, and I quote again, by the will of God from the beginning of the creation and perfectly incapable of being explained mechanically, end of quotation. Newton's criticism of Leibniz would, once the General Scolium was published, which contained a more covered attack on Leibniz, Leibniz's name was never mentioned, resurfaces in the Commercium Epistolicum, Newton's private notes on Leibniz's Tentamen de Motuum Coelestium Causis, and in, of course, the leibniz clark correspondence. Now, what I want to convey uh, here is that Leibniz's intervention had a decisive and dramatic impact on the contact of the general scolium. For the general scolium contains a sustained argument against Leibniz's views. In the long fourth paragraph, Newton made certain aspects of his theological views public, without, however, making his heretical agenda explicit. In the first draft of the general scolium, he dedicated only two sentences to God, namely, and I quote, he rules all things not as the world's soul, but as the Lord of all. He is omnipresent and the universe is contained and moved in him without resistance, since he is not corporeal nor covered with a body." End of quotation. The second draft contains the largest amount of theological material, which was condensed due to its often repetitive character in subsequent, subsequent drafts. Now, at the very start of the fourth paragraph in the, in the published version of the General Scolium, Newton stated his conception of God. And this is quotation one on page 11. And there, Newton says that God is to be conceived as a pantocrator. The words, and I quote, as is supposed by those for whom God is the world soul, were added in the third edition of the Principia. In the second draft of the General Scolium, Newton explained why he denied that God is an anima mundi. Because, he writes, God has no body. Then he developed the implications of his relative conception of God, and this is quotation two on page 11 of the handouts. Now in this passage, which has anti-Trinitarian implications for those with eyes to see it, Newton explained that God is to be defined not in terms of essence, but in terms of dominion. For it is, as Newton emphasized, dominion or lordship that properly constitutes Godhood. In the second draft of the General Scolium, Newton underscored that, and I quote, and this is a very interesting passage, the dominion of God or Godhood is best demonstrated not from abstract ideas but from phenomena and their final causes." End of quotation. The above passage from the published version is not only a sneer at Leibniz but also reflects Newton's endeavour to avoid metaphysical disputes on the nature of God. In the second draft of the General Scolium, Newton stated that, and I quote again, he who will have demonstrated that there is a perfect being without showing that this being is the lord of everything, or pantocrator, has not yet demonstrated that God exists. A being that is eternal, infinite, and most wise and perfect, without dominion, is not God, but only nature. The reference to Edward Pocock's etymological account of the word God in his Specimen Historiae Arabum, which was published in 1650, which was added in the third edition of the Principia, is highly significant in this context. It reads, our fellow countryman Pocock derives the word Deus from the Arabic word do, and in the oblique case, D, which means Lord. Pocock's explanation, according to which the word God derives from the word Lord, in other words, provides etymological support for Newton's view that Godhood is to be defined in terms of Lordship. And by providing Pocock's uh, explanation, he could avoid uh, entering into a theological debate. He could just give etymolog etymological reasons for providing support uh, to his view.
Among the books which Newton owned, there are at least three interesting sources that could have influenced Newton's wording, and I must emphasize this, his wording, of his description of God as a Pantocrator in the general scholium. The first example is taken from John Ray's Three Physical Theological Discourses, which was published in 1693, and this is quotation three on page 12 of the handout. The second example is taken from Clark's The Scripture Doctrine of the Trinity, which was published in 1712. In commenting upon the Apostles' Creed, Clark underscored the significance of the word Pantocrator, and this is shown on quotation 4 on page 13 of the handout. And please note the similarity between the note which Clark uh, added and the note which Newton added in the general scholium. Now this example is of course not very surprising given the fact that Clark and Newton intimately knew each other's heterodox convictions. The third and final example is drawn from a less well-known source. In his anonymously published The History of the Apostles' Creed, published in 1702, Peter King, the first Baron King of Ockham, observed that the primary notation of the Greek word Pantocrator signifies the universal dominion of God over all his creatures and his providential regency and governation of them. Furthermore, this notion, and this is quotation 5 on page 14, and I quote, seems to be leveled and intended against the Gnostics and the Marcionites, both of whom refused to own that God concerned himself with the management and direction of the world, and the former of them at least arrived to that pitch of blasphemy as to attribute unto another being this very title of Almighty, and so on and so on, while they confined the supreme and eternal God within a certain imaginary space, circumscribed by bounds and limits. According to King, another meaning of the word Pantocrator is that it, that it, and this is quotation 6 on page 15, signifies God's immensity, infiniteness or omnipresence, that he is everywhere and in every place, that he contains all things and is himself contained in none that he is incircumscriptible, without bounds and limits, and so on, and so on. These comments square well with the intimate relation Newton saw between God's dominion and his omnipresence. With his denial in Tempus et Locus that God is a little God, a deunculum that fills only a tiny part of space, and with his frequent criticism of the Gnostics in his theological writings. Next, Newton clarified God's relation to space and time, and this is quotation 7 on page 16 of the handout. In the second draft of the general scholium, Newton explained that God is omnipresent because what is never nowhere is nothing. Space and time are, as Newton explained in more detail in his Advertissement au lecteur, which was included in Pierre Desmaiseux's edition of the leibniz clark uh, correspondence, and I quote, modes of existence in all beings an unbounded consequence of the existence of a being which is really, necessarily, and substantially omnipresent and eternal, which existence is neither a substance nor a quality, but the existence of a substance with all its attributes, properties and qualities and accidents, and yet is so modified by place and duration that these modes cannot be rejected without rejecting the existence." End of quotation. Space and time are affections of a being qua being, for whatever is nowhere is not in nature. In De Gravitatione, Newton explained that space and time are emanative effects of, and I quote, the first existing being. Newton's notion of an emanative cause is not to be understood in neoplatonic or gnostic terms, but rather in the sense explained by Henry Moore in his The Immortality of the Soul, published in 1659. That is, and I quote, such, such a cause as merely by being no other activity or causality interposed produces an effect. End of quotation. Newton then moved on to explain God's omnipotence and omnipresence more fully. And this is on quotation 8 on page 16. And I will read this quotation because in my view the Cohen-Whitman translation is very misleading here. And I quote, He is omnipresent not only by his inherent force, but also by his substance. For inherent power cannot subsist without substance. In him all things are contained and move without mutual affection. Sine mutua passione. End of quotation. In the second draft of the general scholium, 
Newton added the following words after virtus sine substantia non potest. And I quote, and what is feigned to subsist without substance is already feigned to be a substance. In Tempus et Locus, composed in the early 1690s, in which he also asserted that the Jews correctly call God place, makom, which is a figurative term used in Jewish theology to denote God's omnipresence, Newton explained in more detail that, and I quote, God's power subsists everywhere in the divine substance as it were its proper subject, and nowhere separately, and has no medium by which it is propagated from its proper substance to external places. End of quotation. This sentence sheds light on what Newton meant with his statement that God is omnipresent not only by his inherent force, but also by his substance. God's omnipotence resides in, so to speak, his substance, which exists always and everywhere. Having mentioned God's substance in the general scholium, Newton warned that God's substance is utterly unknown to us. And this is quotation 9 on page 17. Now, in this context, it is relevant to note that Newton was well acquainted with Moses Maimonides' writings, whose potential influence will be addressed in more detail in Paul Greenham's presentation. Now, in his Porta Moses, Maimonides emphasized that the fundaments of the Jewish religion contain the following propositions, that God is the creator and cause of everything, that he is one and is in no way similar to anything else, that what is one cannot be corporeal, that God alone is to be worshipped, and that it is idolatrous to worship angels, stars, and the elements. Maimonides furthermore denied that we can know God's essence. Once he had completed his characterization of God, Newton explained how it is that to treat of God from phenomena is a part of natural phenomena, or rather natural philosophy. And this is quotation 10 on page 18. Immediately after the above quotation's final sentence, Newton added in the fifth draft of the general scholium that, and I quote, the proximate causes of things come forth from phenomena, and the superior causes from these proximate causes until the highest cause is arrived at, end of quotation. Now, as Steve, Irina and Karen will give more details on Newton's references to the ancients in their presentation, I will keep my discussion of Newton's biblical references short. Some of the draft versions of the general scholium contained biblical references that never appeared in print. Now, there is one sentence in the second draft to which I would like to draw your attention. It reads, and it's on page 19 of the handout, and since he wholly lacks any body and corporeal figure, Newton here inserted a first note, he cannot be seen, heard, or touched, nor ought to be worshipped, and here Newton inserted a second note, in the form of something corporeal, end of quotation. Now note 1 contains references to God's invisibility, namely John 1.18, 5.37, uh, 1 John 4.12, 1 Timothy 1.17 and 6.16, and Colossians 1.15. Note 1 was compo composed first, and it initially contained both references that point to God's invisibility, as well as references that show that God is not to be worshipped in the form of something corporeal. Afterwards, Newton inserted note 2, which is written in a darker and slightly thicker ink. With the same pen in which he added note 2, he also deleted those references in note 1 that refers to God's invisibility. Now, the references in the corrected version of note 1 support Newton's view that whenever we apply human-like properties to God, they are, not to be, they are to be taken as purely allegorical. The references in note 2, which were frequently mobilized by 17th and 18th figures like John Biddle, the father of English Unitarianism, Faustus Socinius, Johannes Krellius, Georgius Aeonidus, Samuel Clarke, and William Whiston. Now, these references would have rendered Newton's subordinationist Christology more explicit, at least to those familiar with the heterodox literature. It was Newton's deliberate strategy not to include these references, which, when properly interpreted, had implications for, God, for Christ's uh, rather relation to God. If this interpretation is correct, then we may expect that Newton was in a position that enabled him to deny that he had addressed the doctrine of Trinity in the general scholium. Although the anti-Trinitarian ethos, albeit implicit, was clearly there to the cognoscenti.
Despite Newton's deliberate strategy, he was criticized by the Anglican churchman John Edwards, who was a kind of veteran of theological wars. In his some brief critical remarks on Dr. Clark's last paper, published in 1714, Edwards remarked that Clark's and Newton's notion of a Lord of Dominion were borrowed from Crellius. Although Newton, Newton never replied in public in a separate draft, preserved in the midst of his additions and corrections to be added in the third edition of the Principia, Newton responded to anti-Trinitarian allegations a la Edwards by arguing that when he wrote about God, he was referring only to the ancient expression of the word God. And this is quotation 11 on page 20. And I will read parts of it. In arguments for the existence of God, God is to be, is to be defined so that his existence is distinguished from the most wise, most powerful and absolutely perfect nature. Whence, by defining the ancient expression of the word God, I have written the following words in the scholium at the end of the Book of Principles, the Principia. And then he quotes his own words, and then he comments these words, as some think idly, do not attend to the doctrine of Trinity, nor to the worshipping of some other God distinct from the Most Highest, or to religion, which is certainly not to be treated in philosophy, but to the expression of the word God as far as they del deliver merely that he is separate from nature, so that his existence might be taught in that uh, sense, and so on. By deliberately leaving Christ, whom he called the Prince of Kings on, on the earth, out of the equation in the published version of the General Scolium, Newton tried to protect the General Scolium from anti-Trinitarian attacks. However, Newton's carefully planned strategy of immunization could ultimately not prevent that such attacks would ultimately be launched. In the Questiones, in the first edition of the Optische, published in 1706, which was translated in Latin by Samuel Clark, Newton for the first time went public with some of his theological views. Now there are no doubt striking parallels between the theological portions of the Questiones and the fourth paragraph of the General Scolium. But if we look at the contexts out of which the former arose, there are some striking differences as, as well. And here I would like to draw your attention to those differences. Now in Questiones 20 and 23 of the first edition uh, of Optische, Newton stated that, and these are his words, the original particles are inert and that motion arises from active principles and from acts of the will. In the Optische, Newton, in other words, denied that gravity is essential to matter, an implication that he would render more explicit in subsequent editions of the optics and of the optiche. The reason why Newton felt compelled to make this point public can be found in the publication of John Toland's Letters to Serena, which was published in 1704, in which Toland uh, uh, argued that m motion and gravity are essential to matter. Now, as if that was not bad enough, Toland linked his, uh, his doctrine with Newton's theory of universal gravitation. Now, Toland, as we all know, was immediately criticized by Samuel Clark, who urged in his a demonstration of, of the being attributes of God that motion, and I quote, cannot be essential to any part of, of matter, but must arise from some external cause, end of quotation, by which he means a non-material cause. Now, whereas the theological portions of the General Scolium were a direct response to Leibniz's theological criticism, the theological passages of the Quaesiones in Optische originated as a response to Toland's theologically unsound appropriation of the theory of universal gravitation. Furthermore, given the hypothetical nature of the queries, it seemed only natural that Newton offered his speculations on the cause of gravity there which he had included to show that he did not take gravity for an essential property of bodies, rather than in the general scolium, in which he famously stated that he did not feign hypotheses on the matter. Both the general scolium and the queries show that Newton made public aspects of his theological views only when he was pressed by external factors to do so. Now, coming to my conclusion. In my presentation, I have shown that Leibniz's letter, which appeared in 1712 in the Mémoire de Littérature, had a decisive and dramatic impact on the contents of the general scolium. 
Newton's theological and methodological attack of the Principia was the raison d'etre of much of the contents of the general scholia. I have also argued that Newton's definition of God in terms of dominion and not essence is reflective of Newton's anti-metaphysical stance in theological matters. I have also reported on a hitherto unmentioned source that may have inspired Newton when he was working on the theological portions of the general scholium, Peter King's The History of the Apostles' Creed. I have furthermore, I believe, unearthed the meaning of Newton's statements statement that God is omnipresent, non per virtutem solam, sed etiam per substantiam. With these words, Newton tried to convey, as the corresponding draft material shows, that God's power subsists everywhere in his omnipresent substance. I've also indicated that the general scolium contained a deliberate strategy of immunization against potentially anti-Trinitarian accusations, which, however, turned out not to be universally successful. Perhaps, ultimately, Newton's virulent response to Leibniz's metaphysical project in the General Scolium can only be understood by taking into account Newton's views on the origins of metaphysics. And these are shown on page 22. Thank you for your attention.